Hi, uh, I'm Reed Kramer of the New America Foundation, and I'm joined by Jason DePaul of the New York Times and Monica Potts of the American Prospect. And uh, each of them recently published an article on poverty in their respective publications. And when I read them, I was reminded once again how um, impactful long-form journalism can be in bringing to light issues in very nuanced ways, and in ways that um, policymakers and advocates often um, forget about. So I thought um, it would be interesting to bring them both here to have an extended conversation about their works and implications for policy. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, Jason's uh, correspondent with the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. He's written on poverty for many years, um, including a book on the welfare reform debates of the 1990s called American Dream. American Dream. And uh, he's also an incoming fellow at the New America Foundation. And his article was called uh, two classes divided by I do. Monica writes for the American Prospect, and uh, her article, uh, which was in their latest issue of the Prospect's Poverty uh, issue, really interesting uh, stuff, um, uh, also was just awarded uh, a prize by the Hillman Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called Pressing on the Upward Way, a Profile of Life in America's, in, in the country's poorest county. Um, so obviously, I recommend reading the pieces themselves, but um, to get oriented here, I wanted to, each of you to kind of talk a little bit about what your pieces uh, were about. So Jason, let's start with you in your, uh, your recent piece. I've been writing about uh, in growing inequality and um, impediments to m mobility uh, for the past six months or so. Um, by mobility, I mean um, the ability of one uh, generation to rise above its relative um, place in the economic order uh, from from the past generation. Um, inequality and mobility often sound like um, uh, or, or, uh, the similar things uh, uh, to the casual observer, but um, politically they, they're quite different because uh, liberals tend to worry about inequality and see it um, uh, its growth as a negative thing, whereas uh, conservatives um, in general are not troubled by inequality, see it as a, uh, often see it as a, a, an unequal society being um, a good thing in that people with different drive, different talents get rewarded differently. But I think both sides um, see um, reduced mobility as a problem. So the conversation about mobility, about whether we really all have um, an equal opportunity to, to uh, advance despite our origins tends to be a place where there's a little bit of convergence of interest right now. And uh, in that context, um, I got interested in the role of family structure mm -hmm. and whether uh, the growing number of, s number of single parent families and the correlation between that and college education um, was posing, uh, was both amplifying inequality and uh, impeding mobility. So um, <clears throat> there's a um, research that shows uh, a, a growing uh, correlation between um, uh, like a college education and, and the likelihood of having a, a, a two two parents together, two parent family, um, where so people what you've got is a f effect where um, the people who aren't finishing college are more likely to um, form single parent families. So you have less pay and only one paycheck, whereas the people with the college educations who are getting the higher paychecks are also getting two of them. Um, so you could quickly see how that would um, exaggerate uh, inequality and. Um, uh, then there's also some uh, evidence that um, kids growing up in single families on average, I think you have to emphasize on average, um, uh, face uh, longer odds than people growing up in, in, uh, right. in two-parent families of attending college and, um, and getting a good job. Um, so as a narrative structure to tell the two stories, we found uh, two women who worked together in a daycare center and by um, all uh, outward appearances were quite similar. Um, they were um, best friends. They did the same, essentially the same job all day long, um, made similar pay. Uh, one was the boss, so she made a little bit more. Um, but one was married and one was not, so um, their overall family incomes were quite different right. and their kids' lives were quite different. They both had children. They were they, right, two mothers, each had a couple of kids, two right. Midwestern women raised in modest circumstances. Um, uh, you would think, you know, would uh, have the same lives, but one went home to uh, uh, a, a bare bones existence on food stamps. She was the single mother raising three kids by herself, right. and the other had a husband. Uh, so together, their income was and three was, times what they could yeah. make alone. And and that was Jessica was the Jessica employee, was a single mother. Chris was the boss. If we if we get back to the conversation, correct. Uh, okay, um, uh, Monica, tell us a little bit about your piece and the story behind it. 
Sure. Um, I decided to go to one of the poorest counties in the country, Owsley County, Kentucky. Um, it's actually the poorest county in America with a majority white population. And it's also very traditionally p poor. Since we've been measuring poverty, it's one of the poorest counties always to, to rank in the all different kinds of poverty measures. Um, and so I wanted to go there because the poverty rate's 40%. The number of families who live in near po poverty is another 30%. So I sort of wanted to see what it would be like to actually to to try to live there and create opportunity there, which was what I wanted to kind of, the question I wanted to answer in my piece. How do you start a business or how do you think about going to college or how do you think about getting a job in a county where, you know, poverty seems almost written in the landscape? So um, I went there in January and February and half of March of this year and just lived there for th two and a half months. Mm -hmm and tracked this family called um, the Christians. Sue Christian, the mother, went back to college when she was 40 using WIA funds and a bunch of other federal help. Um, the father is a handyman and an electrician, and the son had come back after leaving college after one year to start his own business. So they were all trying to answer that question in their own ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jason, I wanted to ask, you know, what, in, in reading your piece and the reaction is gotten, um, what was actually new about the story for you? Um, it seems like we, you know, we, we, we've seen the rise of single-headed households, you know, dating back um, probably, you know, 30 years now. Um, and it's always been inherently challenging to run a family kind of on, on you know, with one parent there. Um, and uh, anyway, wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, what was kind of breakthrough in your mind about why this is a contemporary story and maybe in addition to one that's being kind of played out over decades in America? Um, single parenthood has been quite common for, uh, high rates of single parenthood is, is, uh, has been common for um, several decades or, or, or longer among uh, uh, African Americans and, and poor people. Um, I think what's different now is that um, the fastest growth among single parent families has been in the white working class. So something that used to be defined as uh, uh, conf confined to, mar to uh, marginal populations or poor populations, uh, minority populations, is now middle America. Um, you know, more than half the children born to women in their 30s are now born outside of marriage. So um, uh, I think that's what's, what's, um, that's what's new and the fact that there's so much uh, attention being paid to the problem of inequality right now, right. Um, that uh, uh, you know, there's kind of like the, uh, the two things come together in a way that I, I think hadn't um, been discussed a lot. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I read the pieces. I mean, th they're really captivating characters. You feel for, for all of the characters in these uh, articles. Um, they're all working hard. Um, they're all really s applying themselves. Um, and I was really struck not just by the family structure and how much harder it was for the single mother, but how, how low her pay was mm -hmm. in, in, you know, she did child care and it's, you know, traditionally thought of, you know, as a woman's work um, and extremely low paying. Um, and, and that, to me, was one of the biggest takeaways. Right. I think other people are reading your piece and saying, you know, seeing you as a marriage proponent. I mean, that's just, maybe that was the headline. But anyway, how do you... Um, kind of compare or tease out the various influences of family structure versus almost wage levels and, and compensation? Um, the, w the contributions of stagnant wages um, to inequality is, um, it's, an, it, it's an essential, probably the, the major driver of inequality, right. but it's the one that's been the most discussed. So. Um, obviously, her pay is uh, is a huge part of the story. Right. Um, I think what um, hasn't been discussed as much um, is the um, the the family the, the effects of family structure. And if you look at these two women, one makes thirty five thousand, one makes twenty five thousand. That's a difference. Right. The bigger difference between the two of them is um, the fact that she's got a second income and a second set of parenting hands um, to. Uh, eyes, ears, hearts, hands, right. you know, to help her with the kids. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it clearly emotionally, um, it has a big impact in, in the life of the woman that, yeah, has um, the partner uh, versus the one that didn't. I mean, that but, comes clear. But I, uh, um, there, there, there was no implication as far as, um, a, a, as I'm concerned that um, 
uh, low wages uh, are, are um, not a part of the pro Jessica's problems. I'm naming. He says she's she's the assistant manager of the of the daycare center. And she makes twenty five thousand dollars a year, right. which is just over the federal poverty line for a family of four. So right. she's both in management and on food stamps. Yeah, so. no, it's and and she seems very responsible and, and hardworking, and committed. Like people are probably thrilled that she's there working away. I mean, I know that's how I approach the people that cared for my children when they well, were Well, I was just going to say, yeah, okay. right. She's entrusted. She's, uh, she's uh, responsible enough uh, to be entrusted with uh, the most precious thing these parents have yeah. their children. Uh, and uh, turning to, to your piece, Monica, I mean, it really does seem a little bit like this geography becomes destiny here. Mm -hmm. there, there's, there seems to be, um, you know, just also limited amount of resources and jobs in this county. And, you know, what, 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 is that what you, your takeaway was, or, or were there other factors in kind of a, any kind of culture of poverty that felt like it was part of the story for you, even that's a very loaded term? Um, so it wasn't destiny, but it mattered a lot. You know, it was really hard to get around physically in that area. There's very poor infrastructure. The roads are very bad any amount of bad weather really shuts everything down. And that really changes the way that people think about commerce coming in. It changes the kinds of goods that you can get in. It changes who wants to start a business there. It changes the relationship that you have to the biggest cities nearby, which are an hour and a half away, Lexington, Kentucky. So all of that really sort of does affect the way that people think about themselves versus the world. And they do sort of see their little community as this, um, sort of very separate from the, the world and also they want to protect you know themselves from it because right. they always felt like they've been criticized from it and some of that is um, culturally I won't say culture of poverty but they feel that they are a particular sort of Appalachian culture that is looked down upon um, by people in the liberal Northeast and by people in bigger cities and so that changes the relationship people have when they leave their hometowns and try to travel or try to go to college um, and they don't necessarily fit in very easily and it changes the relationship that they feel people have when they when they come in there's just a constant influx of missionaries and do-gooders coming in all the time and and so it's not exactly an easy relationship really from the point of view of the people there um, so I think that it matters a, a great deal there they do they are very physically isolated and it also they are sort of small town, the small town pride sort of affects the way that they approach the outside world, I'd say. Right. Um, the, uh, the family structure uh, varies, obviously, in these two pieces. You know, here we have kind of an, an intact unit. But interestingly, the, the role of kind of breadwinner has kind of shifted in, in your family. It's, mm -hmm. it's the mother who has the earning potential and the, uh, the male in the household kind of comes and goes in, in the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, not, not just the earning potential, but the maturity. Right, yeah, right. right. Mother, the, in your yeah. story, is the, the grown-up. She's the responsible mm -hmm. one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and she, um, yeah, I, so she wouldn't call herself the breadwinner, and she would really sort of fight that, but right. there are a lot of different ways in which she really was. And um, I would say that also she would say she doesn't know how to relax as easily as JC. And there's a way in which that's a detriment to her at times. She really did suffer through serious anxiety problems, I would say, through a lot of her adulthood, where she really sort of felt like she was the only, that all these burdens were only on her. But JC really helped her a lot. He drove her to school in the snow, and right. he helped her through her panic attacks when she had them. And so it's really hard to imagine Sue and JC making it anywhere alone. I, they right. really, really did help each other. Um, and so that is one thing to think about when talking about family structure and poverty is that just the single fact that another adult is there helping you, right. I think, is very immeasurably good. And is he the father of the two kids? Or yes. is he the, st okay. Mm -hmm. So they've, all, they've been together. Uh, but she was previously married, but there were no kids out of that. There were no kids out of that, yeah. yeah. And, they, and they're both very, they both very committed to raising their children together. And so I think that helped keep them together over right. the years. Um, but I did have a question for Jason, yeah. if it's okay. I, um, there have been a lot of policy debates about what policymakers should do with family structure, right. right? Whether they should promote marriage or whether they should just sort of try to um, imitate the influence that marriage has in single family households or single parent households. And I was wondering if you thought about those debates at all when you went there. 
you asked us um, by way of preparation what were the policy implications yeah. of what we um, uh, looked at. Even though both pieces yeah. stayed away from policy in some respects, um, you know, anyway. Well, the two most obvious policy conclusions that I could think of from my um, article had nothing to do with family structure. They had right. to do with um, food stamps and the tax credits because on a $25,000 income, Jessica relies um, heavily, heavily on the tax credit. She gets, I think, $7,000 between the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. Right. So that's a huge supplement to her income. And um, significantly, also, she relies on, on food stamps. Um, so the preservation of those supplement, uh, earning supplements for low-wage workers, right. I, I thought was uh, uh, the, the most immediate and, and essential uh, policy thing that flowed from, from that uh, or, or uh, article, you know, the yeah. importance of those to, to her family. Um, you know, I don't know. I think one reason why family structure doesn't get um, discussed more is because um, who knows how to right. promote it. Uh, uh, um, uh, gosh, if I knew that. You yeah. Know, I mean, well, I, I think um, uh, one place to start is at least by making it um, uh, a, a topic for um, uh, you know, intelligent discussion. Right. And, and, uh, which it hasn't always been, and um, can be, um, uh, it can be a divisive and a polarizing uh, issue. But um, I think, uh, and I think the left want, at one point, you know, heard it as a kind of blame the victim, or right. um, or even an anti-feminist language. You know, that why should a woman need a man? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think that has substantially shifted, not entirely, but um, I mean, you've got very prominent liberal academics like Sarah McClanahan or uh, Christopher Jenks who are pointing to it as a driver of inequality, and you know, I think that's good. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, what I'm always taken by uh, in some of the conversations and the trends in, in family structures, just how diverse they are now in, in America. Like, they're, they're, you know, it, it's, um, you know, seeming like rare to find this unique traditional family of mother, father, two kids, uh, you know, they're still out there. But you see a lot of kids living with other relatives. You see marriages dissolve and, and reform. Um, and so it becomes very hard to prescribe something with, um, with that in mind. Well, but the other thing you, uh, I would slightly disagree with that. Yeah. I, 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 I think where you don't see that, um, uh, you, don't, you don't see that in equal proportion um, depending on people's um, level of education. Among okay. college educated, co college graduate, among women who finished a four year college degree, more than nine out of 10 are having children um, uh, uh, while they're married. Um, and uh, among, you know, as you go down to women with or high school graduates, and, but with less, but, but some college, but less than the four year degree, you know, that jumps up to about 30 when you, percent. When you go down to high school graduates, yeah. it's up to about 50 percent. When you go down to people with less than high school, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than, um, than 50 percent are having children outside of marriage. So um, there's, a, there's a real class gulf right. um, uh, opening up. And how about the, uh, some of the trends about when people are, when women are having children, I assume that. The last time I checked, they were having them later. There was an issue around teen pregnancy focused kind of in the 1990s, some policy efforts uh, and, and other attention. And, and I believe that has been moving where, uh, yes. where, where the teen pregnancy has been on the decline for teen a pregnancy. number of years now. And that um, fits in uh, as well. Um, the, uh, the other, um, you know, yeah. to follow up on your point about um, uh, is a vari the variety of, of living relationships. If you take, um, uh, divide the American population into three groups, right, into thirds, upper, in, by income, yeah. the, the top income, middle income, and lower income. The, the, the upper two thirds, if you go back 30 years ago, one, um, in, in the upper, the top level, I think it was 96% of the kids were growing up with two parents, right. and the second level was 95%. There, you know, two thirds of the of the of the income distribution were essentially the same in terms of, mm -hmm. of the, the way that the kids were growing up in the family structure. The bottom third was somewhat different. Now a gulf has really um, popped up. There's a 20 percentage point or so spread between the two groups, where the upper third, the percentage growing up in sing, in, in two parent families has declined, but has declined much more rapidly uh, among in the middle group. And you're starting, to, you know, you're seeing a gulf there open up. Yeah. So. Um, I think that's what, when you asked me earlier, what's new? I think that's new. Yeah. Um, 
I also, you know, w thinking about the characters, uh, people in your, in your stories, w definitely wanted to know more about them. And I wanted to know more about what they thought about kind of their plight and how they uh, relate to kind of government and policy, like, um, at, at large, like, you know. And then it raised issues for me of kind of almost political engagement and, and empowerment, whether they, you know, vote or participate and whether they see that as, as potentially being able to change their, their circumstance. So uh, your family was um, very, um, or at least the mother was f pretty avid uh, Christian, mm -hmm. devout. I don't know mm -hmm. if she was an evangelical or not, but yes. uh, she was evangelical. So anyway, tell us a little bit about how, what you learned about how they thought about politics, political engagement, and mm -hmm. kind of government. Um, so Sue, the mother, is very conservative politically. Um, she came to uh, she came to politics after she came to religion, um, which was when her son was two. And so she really definitely is very uh, Republican leaning and conservative leaning. Um, she but this was this is really true of everyone in the county almost not right. just her but she sort of views um a lot of government programs there very suspiciously there aren't a lot of industries in town and so government is an industry there right. and there's sort of been a um but not a welcome industry but not a welcome <laughs> industry <laughs> they sort of viewed it as very you know critical of their livelihood um i think the bigger problem is that there seems to be sort of a new program every five years it changes because of things that have nothing to do with the people on the ground in right. Owsley County. They don't necessarily have a huge say in how the programs come down. Sometimes they're run f out of colleges nearby, and so that also feels like it's a separate kind of, um, a separate sort of thing imposed upon them. So almost everyone participates in some federal program, whether they know it or not. Uh, very, very many people rely on food stamps, and very, very many people um, receive welfare. But I even had, some families who receive welfare tell me in a way that was very critical that that family over there receives welfare. So uh -huh. they don't like it. They like thinking that they earn their money and they like thinking that they have chances to earn their money. Um, Do they view the food stamp SNAP program distinctly um, than other kinds of assistance? They do and they by and large don't really want to criticize anyone who relies on it for some period of time. But I heard a lot of stories that there were some people who just, that's all the money that they got during the month, and, right. and they were very critical of those people. I never met those people, um, but I'm sure, I'm sure there are some people who um, don't want jobs and, and just want to get government checks. I'm sure those people exist, right. but it, it was out of proportion to the way right. that people you talked about it. People who were striving and wanted to um, engage. And yeah, almost everyone had some sort of at least temporary relationship to the workforce. Right. And just I'm not sure how much um, in-depth time you spent with, uh, with, with, with Jessica and Chris. Uh, I'm not sure you moved down to, uh, to <laughs> as uh, Monica did, but um, did you get a sense of their kind of view of politics and political engagement? I mean, I, th I think of the lives of some of these single mothers, uh, and I'm like, well, how do they even have time to you know, vote or go to a PTA meeting or anything? I, I, I was surprised uh, at how apolitical Jessica yeah. was because she's um, a thoughtful, reflective yeah. person about um, other things, but uh, the few times I tried to I w she would she would reference some like earned income tax credit and right. I, uh, or the um, food stamps. And I would mention you know there's some discussion in Washington about cutting food stamps and she hadn't heard that and she <laughs> it was kind of like oh really and didn't didn't uh, if it didn't seem to go anywhere. She didn't. Uh, I don't think she had nearly the developed political consciousness that um, soup. Yeah. Um, did. But you know, I, I, I wanted to ask you why, what, she talks about not wanting her kid to go to the liberal college, and, <laughs> mm -hmm. but what does liberal mean? Is that a cultural thing? Is it, a, is it religious for her? Or what, 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 how does she define conservative? And, and what, why do you think she I, sees that as her identity? I think it's primarily religious. Um, she really, she came to politics through the issue of abortion. She's very anti-abortion, and that's probably the single biggest issue that she votes on. Um, and I also think that she sort of identifies, you know, liberalism as something that happens elsewhere. You know, it's a different kind of culture. It's a different kind of um, acceptance of everything, 
uh, that happens in the cities, and so she doesn't really see it as any way related to her life. Um, at the same time, she used WIA funds to go back to college, she d and she didn't really see that as being a liberal or conservative program. She she goes to the free health clinic in her county, which is mostly paid for by federal funds, and but everyone goes there. It's always existed. She was on food stamps for some for some time, amount right? of time. Yeah. yeah, and she you know that was a time that she'd be very um, you know with shame. They were very ashamed. Did she get the earned income tax credit? She does. Yeah, they do qualify. They, I think, almost every year. Uh -huh. yeah, they must have. Um, and I want to say eighty percent of the county qualifies. Something very high. Uh huh. Yeah. So I. I'm not sure why she doesn't see those as liberal programs, and I'm not sure why she sees liberal as something different from how it manifests itself on the ground there, you know, that all of those, almost every program that's come in to the county um, and helped relieve some of the poverty is a program that came from liberal-leaning politicians. But, but her, her conservatism I isn't primarily uh, the size of the federal government, uh, it's, it's, a, it's about abortion. It's about abortion. I also think that she, like everyone in Owsley County, thinks that the government programs there prevent people from helping themselves. I think that that's the prevailing view. Um, and I'm not sure why they think that that's true. But that's generally how they view those that was uh, th That came through very strongly in your, in your article. I thought it was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, please, it's <laughs> your interview. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm done. <laughs> why, um, uh, why does she want to stay there, and why does she want her children to stay there? Well, she has an immense amount of hometown, hometown pride. She's very patriotic. She really loves Kentucky. She loves growing up there. Um, she did have, she has she moved had, away. She moved away for a brief amount yeah. of time, primarily because of her first husband. Um, and she really wanted to go back when she and JC thought that they could go back and, and make a living. It's, you know, it's quiet. She knows everyone in the whole town. She can rely on them to help with her family and raising her children. She actually was president of the parent-teacher organization for some amount of time. She's just really committed to sort of turning it into the kind of place that people want to stay. Um, and the idea of leaving is both unappealing and it also feels like giving up on that mission, I think, for her. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, one of the, the article ends with the, the tidbit that she has the prospects of a new job mm -hmm. uh, working in this college readiness program that the Department of Ed runs called Gear Up. And, and uh, there were prospects for a grant to come through to the local Berea College that mm -hmm. would create this position for her um, that could, you know, be somewhat steady, a salaried uh, employment, even if it was fairly low, it would be a nice um, boost. And again, that's um, another public uh, funding stream that, that might help um, yeah. change her prospects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I imagine it's something you're going to go and check in on them check in on over her. time. Um, it's actually, it's very similar to Gear Up. Gear Up exists in her county, but the program through which she gets a job is okay. Promise Neighborhoods. Okay. Um, and she has it now, um, and she's, it's starting next year. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, we'll, um, we'll tune job. in and look for the follow-up, um, mm -hmm. and uh, with yours too, with your um, your characters. And uh, I thought of one other yeah. similarity between Jessica, who I was following, and, and Sue. Um, uh, they both seem um, like pretty smart people yeah. to me. Um, and w so, whatever is responsible for their economic hardships, um, you earlier mentioned it isn't a lack of work. You know, it's also not a lack of intelligence. And yeah. Um, there are times uh, uh, I hear in, um, even in polite liberal uh, company, uh, why are people, you know, to such people, or maybe they're just not, they can't quite make it in the knowledge economy, they're just not quite smart enough. Right. And I uh, am al uh, repeat, always uh, come back all from a reporting trip um, uh, reminded that um, whatever uh, is is limiting people. It's it's uh, it's not it's not that, and uh, that really yeah. came through with, with Sue, and I certainly felt that with Jessica. Yeah. That this is, um, you know, a, a, a smart person who could have easily made her way through college, you know, intellectually, and whatever's, you know, held her back wasn't that. Yeah. No, she does seem to have yeah both drive and, and the ability to you know navigate uh, some I hard mean, situations. I, I, I think one cultural um, hazard of having. Uh, 
of, of believing that you're a meritocratic society is a, a tendency to um, for many people to to assume even um, unconsciously that the people who don't make it must not be bright enough right. and um, you know mm -hmm. one one great um, benefit of being a reporter and going out and meeting low-income people is um, um, it cures you of any uh, 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 suspicion that that's uh, a factor. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I think is uniting a lot of this uh, work now, both the, the geography and, and, and some of the work um, that, that you've done on, on mobility and inequality, is that, that, that meritocracy in America is, 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 is under threat. And um, that's part of one of the, the challenges. You know, good, smart, hardworking people are not um, having the economy return uh, the goods and, and the shared prosperity we kind of expect. But you know, there, there's, a, I think, a moral hazard for the people at the top if they believe in a meritocracy. Then that, you know, it's an inevitably <laughs> believe, you know, it must mean that I'm smart because I made it yeah. on top. And, uh, and some uh, of their colleagues uh, also have to fall out of it at uh, the top as well for it to be truly uh, meritocratic. So. Yeah. Um, all right, well, thanks for coming in uh, today and for your time. And uh, invite everybody to read the pieces online at the uh, American Prospect and New York Times. And um, maybe we'll check back in uh, later to see how your friends are doing down there. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah.